So good to be with you all this morning. You 1130ers, hope you got that extra hour. Hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Some of you are like, no, I still missed it. Um, I, was, I was pretty impressed with the 9 a.m. crowd that they made it after an hour or less of sleep. Well, it's good to be with you all. Are you guys ready to get in the Word this morning? All right. Well, I'll just tell you, first service was unusually quiet, and I had to reprimand them a few times. Be like, um, are you guys okay? So feel free to give a little feedback this morning. I, I, I was thinking, I hope second service would be more awake than first service. Um, all right. Well, LifeWay Research um, recently did a study that found that six out of ten or two-thirds of American Christians have no idea how to share their faith. Um, they also, in, in part of that study, they, they asked, you know, polled a bunch of, of Christians, um, asking about the last six months of their life, and found that 70% had not shared um, with a stranger anything about Jesus. And only 52% had shared a story or a testimony with a close friend or family member of something God was doing in their life. Interesting. Um, What's also interesting is studies have shown that 82% of people who don't attend church would actually come out your ch- come check out your church if you invited them. 82% of people would come to church with you if you just invited them. Yet, only 2% of churchgoers will ever invite anybody. Dang it. That's tough. Um You know, these statistics are especially shocking or heartbreaking when you compare them to the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read out of the Amplified. You're probably familiar with this verse, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my... Okay, you're a little more awake. (laughs) I'll try that again. You will be my... Witnesses. Witnesses to tell people about me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be empowered to be a witness. What is a witness? Um, The word witness, the the, uh, Greek there, martus, is to give an account of what one has seen, heard, or knows to be true. It also means martyr. This word means somebody who has experienced Jesus who knows the kindness of God, who knows the love of God, somebody who has experienced firsthand and bears witness to the world of what they've experienced. It's, mess, it's being a messenger, um, but really it's, it's coming from, it's not just somebody who's talking about it, it's somebody who's experienced it and is sharing with others what they've personally experienced. You know, God has always called his people to be witnesses, his witnesses to experience him firsthand, intimately, and to share who he is. Um, You might remember the charge that the Lord gave the people of Israel in Isaiah. Isaiah 43.10, Yahweh says, you are my witnesses, my chosen servants. I chose you in order that you would know me intimately, believe me always, and fully understand that I am the only God. This is the heart of God, that we would truly know him intimately and that we would bear witness to him, to the rest of the world. You know, um, we talked about this a little bit on Vision Sunday, or if you've looked at our website, you've seen this, but part of our vision here is to, to experience Jesus and to put him on display to the world. That's what we're committed to, truly experiencing Jesus for ourselves and putting him on display. And we, as a community, are passionate about people truly knowing Jesus as he is. Not the maybe warped, um, westernized, watered watered down, whatever version of Jesus, but truly Jesus of Nazareth, who he truly is in his mercy and his love and his power and his goodness. Our heart is that people would truly experience him. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to go to share, to communicate, to to demonstrate who God is to the world. And the truth is, you don't have to look far to realize people are hungry for God. People are in need of hope everywhere you turn. 
People are in need of encouragement. People are in need of healing. People are in need of breakthrough. People are in need of peace. We, when you look around everywhere, they might not be saying, like, I'm hungry for God, but it is so evident in their life. You know, that the things that we lean on as people are, aren't working. They're not working. And people are longing for peace and longing for hope everywhere. You know, it's a, um, a very interesting time in our nation. Now, obviously, there's a lot of diversity um, in this country, um, you know, for people who are maybe newer here or come from more like traditional ethnic communities, you know, you, you, there are people, obviously, a lot of people in this country who haven't really heard the claims of Christ or understand Christianity, um, who are, um, you know, unfamiliar with, with Christianity. But I would say for the majority of this country, that's not the case. The majority of this country isn't, um, you know, they're people who have, ex- they've heard the claims of the gospel. They maybe have been to church and they don't want to be part of it. They're not pre-Christian, they're post-Christian. Um, you know, they're not primarily unchurched. They've left the church. Or they bought a Christian, of, a, a version of Christianity that doesn't look like the one Jesus taught. You know, the challenge today is not to evangelize the Western world. It's to re-evangelize the Western world to the true gospel of a loving and good God. You know, America is truly transitioning, and many would say has already transitioned into more of a post-Christian culture. Um, We we watched it first happen in Europe and Australia and Canada, um, and it's been shifting here for a while, um, but the last few years have really accelerated that transition. And, you know, people who study these things would say America is really becoming post-Christian, not unreached or unchurch. It's been there, did that, not really interested. Um, Or it's, hey, I picked what I liked from that, and then I added my opinions and my politics and made that my religion. Um, It's not really the dethroning of God it's the enthroning of self with God in the backdrop. It's like, we're not trying to get rid of God. I want, you know, I want God to bless me, but I'm going to be my own God. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's a little bit of that. And that's really what's, what's happening in a lot of ways in the culture. Um, people who might call themselves a Christian, but really in their behaviors and beliefs and lifestyle, you're like, I, I don't even know how this lines up truly with um, the Christianity Jesus taught. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, we've transitioned as a society from having the Bible as an anchor for our life and our choices, and it's become, you know, our feelings or our opinions or our, you know, politics or whatever, self as the focus. And I don't want to idolize times past because I hate when people do that. (laughs) They're like, read a history book, right? Like, it's not, like, the idea of cultural Christianity was not the solution, where everybody just, hey, we're all pretend like we're Christians because we all go to church, but yet, like, slavery or whatever. You know, it's like, let's, you know. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay. So we're not idolizing just, like, blanket cultural Christianity where we all, like, oh, America's a Christian nation, yet in so many ways wasn't. Um, but I think what's really beautiful about this moment and this opportunity is everything's crumbling, and that's actually a really good thing. Because as it crumbles, there's a hunger and a desire for what is real and what is true. And everything that's had mixture has fallen, and the world is just calling BS on it. And it's falling, and that's a good thing. Because that makes space for the gospel to go forward. That makes space for true kingdom thinking to go forward. And so we're at a really pivotal moment in in history, I think. Um, I think there's a real opportunity at hand. You know, so you have what's happening in culture, but then you also have, you know, the big change that's been happening in politics and the social landscape in the last few years that has really shaken a lot of people, crisis after crisis, um, in so many ways exposing so much human dysfunction. And, um, you know, we've seen it in so many different fields from Hollywood, you know, the financial sector, Silicon Valley, military, big business, politics, sports, churches, 
And we've seen this kind of crumbling of what people trusted in these institutions or you know, things where all of a sudden it's like, oh man, there was so much baggage under there. There was so much corruption, there was so much dysfunction. And as these things crumble, it's felt a little insecure. It's felt a little like, whoa. But the beautiful thing is, once again, in these moments, people begin to seek, well, then what can we trust? Well, what is pure? Well, what is good? Well, what is, you know, what is true? And I think that's a thing we should all really welcome because I think that there's this cultural moment that we're living in where people, you know, the culture um, has not delivered what people had hoped it would. And now people are saying, well, what is true? And it's this beautiful opportunity for God to show up. And in fact, so often in moments like this, it's when revivals have happened. It's been renewals have happened. It's where people begin as a society begin to seek God and what is true and what is real. Um, and I think we have to, you know, ask ourselves how we're going to respond in this cultural moment. And, you know, we've watched some, some churches maybe respond. And I'm not saying this to, to criticize. I think, I think churches were trying to figure out how to respond. Um, but I, I watched some churches respond with, okay, well, it's a different time, so just like, let's lower the bar, you know? Like, let's not, let's not push at any idols, don't say anything contradictory. Like let's, you know, like, let's, you know, make it feel like Disneyland when you come to church, and let's just make it real, like, light and sexy, you know? And just have a great time, and real easy, and, and just water down the message, keep everybody happy, you know? And we watch people do that. And the reality is, nowhere do you see Jesus in moments watering down his message. In fact, when culture rages, all the more Jesus would sink his feet in with his truth because what the world needs is more of Jesus, not less of Jesus, right? What the world needs is to see more of who he is, not just a, a, a mock version of what the world is doing. They need to see, they need to see Jesus. The, the truth is the more we become like the world, the less power and influence we have. All throughout history, the church has grown and spread, but it's not because Christians acted like the culture around them. It's the exact opposite. When the culture was greedy, the church demonstrated wild generosity. When the culture was selfish, the church radically served, even died at times in their service of others. When the culture was promiscuous, the church modeled healthy intimacy and fidelity. When the culture was cruel, the church rose up demonstrating great compassion and kindness. When the culture was divided, the church showed up bringing reconciliation and healing. The truth is Christianity and the way of Jesus is no different than it was 2,000 years ago. Yes, culture has changed, and it's going to keep changing, but the ways of Christ do not. And although it's important to be, you know, understand our culture, the answer is to never become like it. It's in becoming wildly more like Christ, right? Without resistance from the church, we, we merely become just a, a mirror of what's happening in the culture around us. The answer is Jesus. The answer is the gospel. The answer is, is the kingdom way. It's more, it's not less. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You know, if I could, you know, in the Jennifer Toledo version of this, should have really published that one day, you'd get a kick out of it. Um, my version might say something like, although I have been ashamed of the way certain Christians have presented Christ, and although I have at times been ashamed of the way churches have treated people, I can say this fully, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of Jesus or his message, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's more, it's not less. This is freedom. There, the world is hurting. I don't know about you, but I feel like my heart is constantly being crushed by the weight of the world. How much pain and suffering is in the world. And for me to stay in a place of hope, I have to keep clinging to the reality. We have the answer. God brings healing. God brings restoration. God makes wrong things right. God sets people free. God heals bodies. How do we know? Because we've experienced it. We know him. 
We have experienced it. This is not just a church of people who, who just, you know, have heard these stories. We've experienced it. I've heard your stories. I've watched your life. I've seen this in my own life. We know our God can do the impossible. We know our God can transform the most broken lives. We know our God can heal and bring peace and set free because he's done it for us. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. Jesus um, was speaking to his disciples, and he said, The harvest is abundant, for there are many who need to hear the good news about salvation. But the workers, those available to proclaim the message of salvation, are few. Therefore, prayerfully ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Interesting. Interesting. You know, what's interesting is one in three people in this world profess to be Christians, and yet Jesus is here saying, there's so much harvest, but there's so few people willing to go into the harvest. I mean, those statistics we read this morning are evidence of that. And I would say probably for most of us, it's not because we're like, oh, I hope people like, you know, figure it out on their own. Like, I think, I think there's so many reasons Christians don't share. Like, they feel like, well, I don't want to offend somebody, or, or I don't want to, like, you know, people have probably had bad experiences. I don't want to be another bad experience. I, you know, what if I say the wrong thing? We get insecure. We get in our head. There's probably a million reasons, right, why we don't. But Jesus is saying, pray. Pray that more people will truly become a witness. Why? Why does Jesus say this? Because Jesus loves people. God loves humanity. God is passionate for people. God longs to break in and touch your coworker. God is obsessed, thinking about, in love with your neighbor, longing to heal them. God is passionately in love with people at your, at your school, with, with your, you know, people you went to high school with. You're like, oh, I didn't even know God cared about those folks. He does. Your family, God cares deeply about people, right? This is his posture towards humanity, pure love. And, and so often, you know, when you, when you think about this, sometimes Christians have presented God in a way that God is offended by people's sin or that God is put off by people. For God so loved the world while we, were, while we were still sinners, right? That he chased us down with his love. He sent his own son because he is in love with us. And so often we as, as Christians have focused on the wrong thing, right? We think it's our job to fix people, to get them to act a certain way. The reality is that's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job, right? And last I checked, you or I are not the Holy Spirit. Our job is to love people, Help connect them to God from that place of connection and, and love in that safety of that relationship. The Holy Spirit never leaves us the same, right? He grows us and heals us and transforms us. God is longing for humanity. For the rest of our time this morning, I want to be in, um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, you can join me. Anybody still bring their Bible to church? Oh, oh, I see one, two, three. Okay, I've got a handful. Five. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Sword drill, let's go. Anybody? No, you didn't go to youth group? You didn't go to Awana's? You missed out. All right, we're going to be in, in Luke chapter 10. Um, what's happening here in this passage is, you know, this is where Jesus is um, sending out his disciples to go and, and be a witness and um, there's three things I want us to focus on in this passage this morning. And it's, number one, that Jesus gives his disciples a mission. Number two, he gives them a message. And number three, he gives them a motivation. And I think that these three things are so vital that we get right. Because if our mission, our message, or our motivation are off, it can be really hurtful to people around us. Um, and I think a lot of pain, you know, has, has happened because um, at times Christians maybe have confused their mission, their message, or their motivation. So what's happening before Luke 10 is Luke 9. And what's happening in Luke 9 is Jesus gathers his 12 apostles and he commissions them. He says, go out 
and, you know, I want you to go out, I want you to, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, preach the gospel, I'm with you, go, and they go. And then he gets another big group. And that's what's happening here in Luke 10. He gets a bigger group, 72 people. And we don't get names, which makes me, you know, I like that when I see that in the Bible, that it's not just certain people that are known, right? It's, and it's Jesus, just all my followers, right? Like, you don't have to have some big platform, just you, who you are in your life. And he commissions them. He gives them the exact same commission. And he says, I want you to go out, okay? So we're going we're gonna to read that together. Um, we're going to start in Luke 10, verse 1. After the Lord appointed 72 others, also, by the way, I'm going to stop like every verse, so just don't be annoyed, okay? After the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Okay, pause. I love that God sends them out in groups, Many times, God has strategically placed people around you for specific things he's called you to do. God is all about community. We're a body, right? God, God loves to pair you up for kingdom assignments. So often, we get stuck in, oh, why did God make my friend move? Why? Like, I wanted that partnership or that thing or whatever. And we, we get so discouraged about where we're not or who's not running with us right now, that we can overlook who God has actually put around us to run with right now. Don't miss who God's put around you right now because you're so caught up or offended that X, Y, and Z aren't there. Okay? Pay attention to God, who God's putting in your life right now. And let me give you a little side note. Many times, I know this to be true in my own life, he will put people you probably wouldn't pick. Somebody, I got an amen from one person. <laughs> Have you noticed this? Many times, God will strategically place around you somebody you might not have picked for yourself. But it's actually exactly what you need in this season for what he's called you to do and who he's called you to become. Don't miss the gift of God because so often we're drawn to just, I just want somebody that's just like me. Well, there's enough of that in the world. You know what I mean? Like, you, we need people that see things differently than us. And God often will bring people who will rub you a little bit, who will see things a little differently than you do, who will challenge you. And we need that in our life. If not, we just become obnoxious, like, echo chamber humans. Don't do it. Okay? Embrace who God's putting in your life. Okay? Jesus strategically places people together and sends them out on mission. Um, also, note in this verse, it says that he sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place he was about to go. So if God is calling you somewhere, into a new job, into an industry, into a neighborhood, into a new school for your kids, whatever. If God is calling you somewhere, it's because he is headed there. It's because he wants to show up there. He's on his way there, and he's strategically placing you there. So often, we want to go to places, well, you know, I'd rather just go and where there's like revival. Well, wouldn't we all? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I'd rather just go where it's like, whatever, heaven on earth. Okay, great. Well, like, how about you go where God is trying to go? Not where God's already been. Right? So God sends us to places he's planning to show up to. So if God is calling you somewhere, a certain school, a new job, whatever, you can trust he has intentions to show up there. Okay? Verse 2. Jesus tells them, the har this is the verse we already read, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into this field. And I will say this, the harvest is plentiful. I remember when we first moved to L.A., you know, probably about 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, and people were like, oh, L.A. is going to be so hard. And I was like, we were coming from the Midwest and South for a hot minute. It's a slight hotter and longer minute than I would have appreciated, but... Um, I'm a California girl, but I was patient with Sean and Hona as they uh, heard the Lord. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> to come back to the glory land. Um, 
No, but it, I actually found it, th there was so much, like, it was like, you couldn't catch the fruit fast enough if you tried in California. I felt like people are hungry. The harvest is ripe. People are hungry. When you look at, you know, the, all the cultural things we talked about, people are hungry. Not to mention all the statistics around anxiety rates and loneliness rates and, you know, addiction rates. I mean, it's just astronomical. People are hurting and people are hungry and people are seeking. And it's whether you have eyes to see or not. You can look around and be like, what a mess. Or you can look around and be like, people are hungry. Man, if I just stood here as a witness to the goodness of God, what could happen? And you just, you won't even be able to catch the fruit fast enough. That's the reality. Um, I, I read this funny thing. Um, this pastor was telling this story about this, and he said, um, he was starting a sermon one Sunday, and he said, I'd like to make three points today. First, there are millions of people around the world who are going to hell. Second, most of us sitting here today don't give a damn about that. And after a long pause, he continued, and my third point is that you're more concerned that I, your pastor, said the word damn than you are about the millions going to hell. <laughs> And his whole point it was, so often we can focus on the wrong things. So often we get caught up on not the reality that God is madly in love with humanity and pursuing people, but we get caught up on, well, I don't like them, and they offend me, and this, that, whatever. We get caught up on all the wrong things. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. That's sad to me. Verse 3, Jesus says, go, like a whole sentence, go, go. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, rude, and do not greet anyone on the road. I want to talk about that last part first. Um, don't greet anybody on the road. I think this is about don't get distracted. I am sending you out. Don't be like, squirrel, well, what am I doing? Like, don't, stay on mission. Stay focused. Life is short. Our time on this earth is short. You have a small time to be able to impact people. And, and the reality is your little, little steps, your little actions, your little comment, your little love can truly impact, deeply impact generations. You could shift one person's life and it could shift who, because a new direction they've chosen, who they then marry and what they choose to do. And literally, generational lines could be shifted because you chose to bear witness to who God is, right? Don't get distracted. This whole thing about um, don't take a purse or bag or sandals. This is about don't worry about so often we're like, well, God... If I stop and talk to this person, like, it's going to, like, mess up my whole schedule. Or how, how are I going to be provided for? Like, we so worry about all the little trivial things in life. And God's like, let me provide for you. Let me look after you. Let me take care of you. He's saying, I'll provide for you. Don't worry about that. But he calls us to go like lambs amongst wolves. Remember or notice here, who are the lambs and who are the wolves? Have you ever met some Christians that go out, like, very wolfishly? <laughs> We're not called to be the wolves. We're not called to, like, repent! You know, like, I've seen... You ever have people like that on your campus? Like, you're like, whoa, such a wolf. Like... We're called to be lambs. We're called to be humble. We're called to be merciful. We're called to be kind. We're called to go out into the world like lambs, tender, kind, compassionate. But Jesus' message is go. We all have a mission, every single one of us. Every single one of us are designed to go. Go to people in pain, go to the lost, go to broken systems, go to nations, go to the inner workings of culture. Have you noticed there is no such thing as a stay Christian? Nowhere. Are you going to see a verse that says, stay, be very private in your faith and do nothing. 
and I shall bless thee. You don't see that. The whole Bible is your salt, your light. Go, rah, 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 great commission. Go, go, the whole world, nations, make disciples. I mean, the whole Bible is activating you. The Holy Spirit activates us. So often in the West, we have this very private Christianity. We don't ask anybody, we don't tell anybody, it's my private religion, and it's, it's so bizarre because it just doesn't line up with scripture. The truth is, every single one of us have been sent on a mission. We are all on mission. This whole passage, the whole beginning of this section is that we are on mission. We are all called to go. Every day. It is not an accident you're in LA. It's not an accident that you're working where you're working. It's not an accident that you're in the neighborhood you're in. You are called to go and to bear witness, to bring hope and encouragement in life. You know, in Ephesians 2, it says that we're God's workmanship, created in Christ, Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Not just like a general mission, you have specific missions in your life. Things that because of your personality, your experiences, the pains you've suffered, the victories you've had, how you see the world, your race, your age, all of those things play into the fact that you are uniquely crafted by God to do specific things. There are people that will only listen to somebody just like you. There are conversations only you can have because of your experiences. There are demons only you can drive out because of the authority you've gained in your life in certain areas. There's hope you can bring to somebody because of your unique set of circumstances that are so unique that only you could bring hope in a situation like that. You are designed by God to, for beautiful and powerful things. We are all called to be on mission. We can go through life and just float and live for ourselves, and life will pass like this and our impact will be nothing. Or we can truly step into the fact that we are called to be on mission. And as we love people and serve people, all of a sudden we begin to watch lives be transformed. The second thing we see in this passage is that God has given us all a message. We have a mission and we have a message. Luke 10, 5, Jesus tells them, okay, now when you go out, when you first enter a house, first say, peace to this house. I love this. I love that Jesus teaches his disciples, listen, this is your first step. This This is A, do not get to B unless you've done A. First step is your message, my friend, is peace. You are not here to stir it all up, tell everybody what they're doing wrong. You're not here as a wolf to bite everybody. You are here, my little lamb, to bring peace. Step in and say, peace. Once again, he's saying, step into this unbelieving Gentile house. Step into a sinner space and all their mess, and all their things, and just say, peace. I'm here in peace. There is peace between you and God. Peace. Be a messenger of peace. If only we did this, right? (laughs) Historically. Y'all are going to do better. Um, We're as a church going to do better. But historically, I wish, and it has been true, for so many Christians have stepped into spaces around the world and truly demonstrated peace. But I think we've also seen so many noisy people who, in the name of God, don't represent God and have not come with a message of peace. And it's been so destructive. Peace is the message. Right? So we're called to bring peace to your workplace, to your neighborhood, to your family. You're anointed to bring a message of peace. Jesus came to make peace with sinners, not fight them. He came to make peace for the oppressed. He didn't come to judge them. He came to bring peace for the afflicted and the confused. He didn't come to reject them. We are on a mission and our message is peace. Verse 6. If somebody who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. In other words, you don't lose. 
You're going to maintain your peace no matter what. Either your peace is going to spread and other people will be impacted by your peace. And if it doesn't, you can still stay in a place of peace. You're not a victim to other people and all their things and all their stuff and their attitude and their mood. You get to stay in peace no matter what. Okay? Uh, Verse 7, Jesus says, and I love this part. (laughs) Jesus says, stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Now listen, I recognize I may be interpreting this wrong, but I don't think that I am. I'm pretty sure Jesus shares my opinions on this. I feel like Jesus is saying, don't be high maintenance. Don't be a high-maintenance Christian. You are there to serve, not be served. Don't be a diva. Don't be everything about you and, oh, I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to do this. And you know, so We see this so often in culture, right, where pe- we see people that just, there's so much self that it's like, I will only use this gift God has given me unless I'm, you know, better be in the front row and I better have this big contract and I better, and it's just all of a sudden you're like, wait, I'm so confused, Where did Jesus or his disciples ever act like that? Y'all okay? Y'all with me? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I feel like that's what Jesus is saying. Don't be high maintenance. Eat what's put in front of you. Like, have a good attitude. Be grateful, right? But he's also like, don't be a martyr either. A worker is worthy of his wages. So it's not taking on this weird martyr mentality, but also it's, We're here to serve, not be served. If Christians actually showed up in every environment, I'm here to serve. We should not be, you should not be, I should not be the most high maintenance person in your work environment. Right? Because your life is your message, not just what's coming out of your mouth. You with me? You should not be the most high maintenance friend the most high-maintenance person in your family. You know, why? Because our life is our message. We're here to bring hope, to bring life, to bring encouragement. And if you are, that's okay. Let Jesus work on that. (laughs) Let Jesus heal that part of us, right? Because part of how we're going to love the world around us is decentering ourselves. Y'all okay? Okay, all right. Um, So, stay there. You know, eat what's given. Um... Don't be high maintenance. That's not our culture. You come from a different kingdom. And then it goes on, verse 9. Jesus tells them, All right, once you've done that, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for this town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Um, For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. All right, there's a lot going on in here. Let me give you a little bit of of background of what's happening here. Um, Tyre and Sidon were Gentile cities. These were places Jesus did not preach, Jesus did not go to, Jesus didn't do miracles in. These were, from the Jewish perspective, the bad guys, the outsiders, ew. And Jesus is saying, it's going to be better for those guys than for these cities. And he names the cities that are Jewish towns full of the religious, full of people who knew the scriptures, places Jesus had went, places Jesus performed miracles, places Jesus had preached, places Jesus taught, you know, all of this where you see Jesus present and yet they still could not dethrone themselves. Yet there was still pride. Yet there was still self-righteousness. And Jesus says, Woe to you. He's not coming for the like picture of what the Jews thought was the sinner. He's coming for the religious who could not 
dethrone themselves. Are you with me? Jesus says, woe to you when you've basically been in church and you, you know all the things and yet you still won't place God as Lord of your life. It's going to be better for people that never even knew me. It's a powerful statement. Kind of scary. Okay. Help us, Jesus. Um, but verse 9 begins with Jesus telling them, when you get there, heal the sick who are there and then tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. I love this. I think this is a great strategy for how you show up at work. I think this is a great strategy for how you engage with the world around you. Before you open your mouth, show up and heal something. Show up and help. Show up and serve. Show up and meet a need. Show up and bring a solution. Show up and be life-giving. Roll your sleeves up. Do something. Serve. Heal. Bring peace, bring encouragement. Hey, I was thinking, boss, this would really help. If we could do, wow, that's a great solution. Like, show up with healing in the environment. This is the strategy Jesus gives his disciples, right? Your message is peace. So show up, release peace, bring healing, and then, and then, you'll have the influence to say, the kingdom of God is near. I love this strategy. You know, when we first moved to, to Los Angeles, um, this is the, really the strategy God gave us. He said, I want you to begin to learn the, the issues of the city, find out where you can really serve. And it was in that where we began to realize, okay, there is a massive foster care crisis and various other things that were going on. And so as a church, we just said, nobody knows who we are. Like, we're this little church. We're just going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to just begin to serve however we can. And for 18 years, we have literally been serving the foster care system in LA. And because of that, now we have influence and we have a voice and we, we get invited into spaces to speak into things and help shape things. Why? Because we were a part of serving and healing something that we didn't break. And this is really the invitation is for us to really influence and be a witness and be able to impact the world around us. Can we show up and bring healing? It's a problem we didn't make. Can we show up and serve? Can we show up with solutions? It's so easy for people to stand on the sidelines and critique, complain, judge. It's so much easier. But it's going to change nothing, and it gives you zero influence, right? So when you begin to get in there, and you just begin to serve and love and heal, and I love that that's the strategy Jesus says, heal the sick and then tell them about who I am, and then tell them the kingdom of God is near. I love that. I think it's good for us to ask our ourselves the question, what is the message coming out of my life? Do people hear the message of peace? Do people hear, do people see me actively engaging to heal and bring peace in life? What's the message my life is, is communicating? We all have a mission. We all have a message. And, you know, as this ends here, this last section, Jesus begins to challenge um, his disciples' motivation. And this is really important because having the slightly wrong motivation can really get you off, right? So verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied in pure Jesus fashion, Psh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I don't know. I just feel like he's like, Psh. you're impressed by that. Um, <clears throat> I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. <clears throat> this is the motivation. Listen, these guys were excited. They just got back from a good missions trip. They saw breakthrough. They were pumped, right? Their hearts were pure. But just the wrong motivation can get you off. Notice they're not saying, Jesus, we saw people get set free from demons. They're saying, Jesus, the demons listen to me. Like they're centering themselves. Slight difference. 
When you begin to, especially if you've been like in a drought season, when you begin to see God move or you begin to see breakthrough or you begin to, wow, you got this incredible opportunity, this door open, this whatever, it's easy to begin to slightly think that you had something to do with it. Oh, it's because I'm a really hard worker. That's my charisma. We start to kind of center ourselves And what Jesus is reminding in this story is that our motivation should never be and our identity should never be in our strengths and our victories and what we're seeing, good or bad, our circumstances, but our motivation should always be and our identity should always be in that we are sons and daughters of the living God. That is secure. Because if your motivation becomes your success, you will inevitably begin to manipulate people to keep that because it's feeding you. You will inevitably, when people turn against you, you will inevitably begin to dishonor, to cut them off because it's threatening your very existence. We see this all the time. But if your motivation is, I am loved, I belong to God. There's nothing I could do to earn his love. There's nothing you could do to take it away. I'm secure in him. See, that's the right motivation. And I feel this morning, I've been feeling this just stirring in my spirit. There's like um, a a re-invitation and a reawakening for his church to truly become witnesses. You see, the, the reality is I feel like the last several years, Um, So many people, and if I can just say this candidly, I feel like so many people who had a sound mind, who were balanced and logical, felt so silenced because the extremes were so loud. And so many people, especially if you have a heart for justice, tried to speak up. And now let me give you like a quick 30 second narrative of this, okay? If, If you... The, the, true kingdom justice, because it's, it's established in God's agenda, God's heart, God's government, God's ways. Do you know what stands in opposition to k- true kingdom justice? It's a political spirit. Because a political spirit is about man's agenda, man's government, man's ways. And so whenever you take a stand, I've seen this over and over, whenever you take a stand for justice, the political spirit will immediately come and begin to attack. Now, several things happen. First, the political spirit will always accuse the justice person of being political every time. But the political spirit is a bullying spirit. Now, I'm not, listen, everything's not a demon. I'm not that person. But there are real spirits at work, okay? There is a real kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness, and this is helpful to understand. The political spirit will bully and intimidate and get you to be quiet and to sit down and to stop speaking truth and stop speaking justice. And I have watched so many people in the body of Christ in the last couple years as a political spirit has raged in this nation. I have watched so many people who carry a heart of justice, who carry a kingdom mandate to speak truth and healing and peace and and order and, and to set the oppressed free, feel silenced, feel intimidated, feel like I can't say anything but is too dang crazy out there. And I feel people have just kind of shrunken a little bit. And I feel this invitation of the Lord saying, listen, church, we have got to learn to stand up against this thing. We've got to learn how to find our footing. We've got to learn how to truly bear witness in this day because the world is hungry. The world is desperate for a message of peace. The world is desperate for hope. The world is desperate for encouragement. And Jesus is chasing people down. He's in love with humanity all the people you struggle to love he is so in love with and he's saying will you please go will you please bear witness to them that I love them that I'm good will you please go into the harvest field I just see him weeping like will you go to those ones nobody else is going will you go will you, will you have the courage to speak up Give them hope. You might be the last person to encourage them before they make some terrible decision for their life. You might might be the one person who could really impact them. And I feel like he's delivering us from this, like, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking 
for too many people. I feel like for me, he's delivering me. I'll use that. He's delivering me of just an old school mindset where I thought about evangelism like, you know those memes? Can I talk to you about your Lord and Savior? You know, like chasing people down like awkwardly. You know, or you think about like your parents or your grandparents' generation where it was like handing out tracts or like some kind of awkward. Like, also, we're going door to door. We're not going to be weird, guys, okay? You heard the announcement. We're not going to be weird. We're inviting our neighbors to Easter to have fun with us, to meet us at the park, have tacos, come and come to church with us. We're going to give them gifts. We're going to bless their business, okay? Join us. Come to, come to these. Also, don't forget your cards on the way out. Okay, if after this message, you still don't get cards, come on. Um, invite people to church for Easter. But listen, I feel like God is, there's a new way that this is supposed to look. It's not going to look like it's looking past generations. And I feel like God wants to set us free from the like uh, awkwardness or fear around it. And he's going to help you find your voice again. He's going to help you find your voice. And I want to encourage you next week, um, we're going to have a panel. I'm very excited about it. We're going to have a couple of folks from our our community. Um, We're going to have a panel. We're going to just hear some stories about how people are sharing their faith in their workplace, in their industry, like in a really normal and real way. How people are just loving the people around them. And I hope that it will really inspire us and provoke us because it's time for us to truly take our take our place as, as witnesses. Because there are a lot of voices out there that I would like to see. <sighs> just quiet down a little bit. And a lot of voices in here I'd like to see get louder. I think that's how God feels. <laughs> Once again, I always think God agrees with me. But, okay, would you stand with me as we close? I'm going to pray for us this morning. Jesus, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for the beautiful and unique way that you've wired them. Holy Spirit, we invite you to truly fill us and teach us how to really be a witness. A voice of hope, a voice of love, a voice of encouragement. I pray, God, right now that you would just begin to even highlight people to us at work, in our neighborhood, our Trader Joe's checker, our barista, that other mom at your kid's school, guy you see at the gym, whoever, Lord, that you begin to highlight people that you love and are longing for, that you're longing to encourage, that you're longing to let them know that they belong. God, I pray for us that you would help us to Help us to find the courage. Help us, Lord, to to begin to see people like you see them. God, to to know in those moments, oh, I gotta go back for that girl. I gotta stop for her. I gotta make sure she's okay. Uh, I need to call that person. I need to check in on them. God, that we would be sensitive to your spirit. God, I thank you that you have chosen us to be light. You have chosen us to be your ambassadors on this earth. You have chosen us to be your messengers, your your hands, your feet, your hugs, your voice of encouragement. God, I pray that we would not take that lightly. I pray, God, that our heart would burn again for the hurting and the lost, Lord, those who, who need to know that you love them. Help us to dethrone ourselves and our own insecurity and just to to center on you, God, and to center on people. And God, for those in this room that maybe would say, gosh, I don't even, I don't even know anybody that's unsaved. God, I pray that you would get them new friends. Help them to meet their neighbors, Lord. Get them, get them involved in places, Lord, where, where um, call them. Make space for them in in new spaces, Lord, where they can really be a blessing to people. I pray that we would never get comfortable. Well, I'm good, so we're good. Lord, I pray that we would stay challenged and we would stay um, hungry 
to see your kingdom come. And Father, I just declare this over our church. God, we pray, we say, God, let this be a place where people can come and feel safe and feel loved and feel welcomed and feel known. God, I pray that this would be a church where people who maybe didn't feel safe in other churches would feel safe here, that they'd feel known here, that they'd feel loved here, Lord. We'll take, we'll take them all, Jesus. We want people to see you and experience you and know you. God, I thank you for the harvest that's coming in Los Angeles. And I thank you for every person in this room that are your harvesters. I pray, God, for courage. And I pray, God, that you would lead them and guide them. And that through our lives, Lord, that people would get to experience your love and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen.